Welcome to Chicago Reacts. My name is Kit. This is Jose. Uh, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Uh, be sure to share our content on social media. And with that being said, we've got an awesome video series to react to. The word hero is not used often. The word peacemaker is not used often. The word of family values and protecting one's dignity and rights are not used that much often. But only one person in history can actually claim all of this and still remain Great. That's right. We are going to be reacting to the video se series Alexander the Great, the hero of the world, leader of the free world, someone who brought peace and prosperity to all nations around him, not through violence, but through understanding and sharing of culture. Everyone, I hope you enjoy this series. And I'm quite clear, and I'm pretty sure that if you are a historian buff that you like Alexander the Great, be sure to join us because this is going to be a fun series. Let's get started with the first video. In 334 BC, Alexander, king of Macedonia, began one of the greatest military Glorious. campaigns in history. Glorious. The superpower of the age, the Persian Empire. How dare they? Peter. Just 20 years old, his brilliant and fearless leadership won him battle after battle. Through peace. Oh. And in an astonishing 10-year campaign that took him to the edge of the known world, he carved out one of the largest empires ever known. Good. Few men have had such a massive impact on the course of history. To the Persians, he was Most Alexander normal, the Accursed. But to the West, he was immortalized as Alexander the Great. The greatest great. Well, that's the greatest. The great. The greatest of the greats. Ancient Greece. From around 500 BC, this rugged land was the scene of remarkable developments Democracy. in art, philosophy, and warfare. Its two greatest city-states were Athens, a naval power where democracy, art, drama, and philosophy flourished and Sparta, Sparta, an austere militaristic society famed for its formidable army. In 480 BC, these two city-states had joined forces to fight an invasion by the mighty Persian Empire. At the narrow pass of Thermopylae, a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans held up the enormous Persian army for three days before they were finally encircled and killed. They will live on Then, forever. in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek Seven fleet years. defeated the Persian navy. Right. But they couldn't prevent the Persians burning the sacred temples of the <gasps> Athenian Acropolis. What a sad day. The next year at Plataea, the Greeks won a decisive land battle against the Persians and forced them to abandon their invasion. That's what's up. The well next 50 years were the golden age of classical Greece. Hmm. But rising tension between Athens and Sparta and their allies eventually led to war, hmm. dragging the Greek world into decades of destructive fighting. Probably Persian ops. <sighs> that was between Persian the Greek city-states continued for almost a century, I don't think leaving them exhausted and History. vulnerable to a new rising power to the north. Macedon. For centuries, sophisticated Greeks had viewed the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a backwater, Hicksville, barely Greek at all. But under King Philip II, Macedonia emerged as a formidable military force. His most famous reform? The introduction of the Sarissa, an 18-foot pike, twice the length of a normal Greek spear, and wielded by trained infantry, fighting in close formation, known as a phalanx. All right, Rogaldorn, that's a shout out to you. Phalanx. The greatest in ship in the Imperium. BC at the Battle of Chironia, 
<laughs> Philip's army crushed the joint That's forces of Thebes the... and Athens. For centuries, no? Ow. Through alliance and conquest, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighbours. Now, following this victory, he united all Greece in an alliance known as the Hellenic League, or League of Corinth, with Philip as hegemon, or supreme commander. Hmm. Only Sparta stood aside. Self-sufficient. Philip huh? began to plan a great campaign, a pan-Hellenic or all-Greek war against the Persian Empire. Why? Their old foe was now because an ailing superpower. Glory. Its great riches right for the taking. Out and fish, man. <laughs> but on the eve of launching his war, Philip was assassinated by his own bodyguard, <gasps> victim of Macedonia's <laughs> brutal Sorry. court rivalries. We're gonna go, guys. We're gonna go. We're gonna go. Just... He was succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Alexander. Brilliant, restless tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle, oh, and already an experienced military commander. The guy that took all the credit for the people that said Sparta. Alexander nice. inherited his father's grand plan Smart to guy. invade Persia. But first he had to secure his own position as king. At home he had potential rivals executed. That's then right. crushed rebellions in Illyria, Thessaly, and central Greece. Rebel scum. He made a special example of Thebes. Right, Thebes completely go. destroying the ancient city and too. selling its people into slavery. Oh, mm. well, see, that's not so great. Well, in the spring of 334 Thebes BC, had it <laughs> now ready to launch his war against the Persian Empire, Alexander led yeah, his man. army across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. It was the start of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. It is a pretty insane thing to do. All right, here we go. Oh my Macedonian God. army. Black market gaming. Alexander's Black army market was about 40,000 strong, drawn from all parts of Greece. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian general Parmenion. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian phalangites, armed with the 18-foot sarissa. These were professional soldiers, well-trained and drilled, who formed up for battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. Man, ah, this pack glorious. formation presented a solid wall of iron spear tips and was virtually unstoppable. But it was also difficult to maneuver and highly vulnerable to attacks on its flanks or rear. So 3,000 elite infantry, the hypaspists, or shield bearers, armed with shorter spears, guarded its flanks. They were commanded by Parmenion's son, Nicanor. The second line of Alexander's army was made up of 7,000 Greek allies and 5,000 mercenaries, armed as hoplites. They took their name from the hoplon, their large round shield, and carried shorter eight-foot spears. A hoplite phalanx was not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, but still well armed and heavily armoured for the time. The Agrianes were the army's elite skirmishers, expert javelin throwers from what's now southern Bulgaria. Other skirmishers from Thrace and Illyria were armed with javelins, slings and bows. The shock troops of Alexander's army were the Companion Cavalry. 1,800 elite horsemen, armed with spear and sword, commanded by Philotas, another son of Parmenion. Alexander led the royal squadron in person. There were also 1,800 cavalry from Thessaly, commanded by Callas. 600 from other parts of Greece, led by Erigius, and 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia under Cassander.
The great Persian Empire was divided into provinces, called satrapies. Each satrapy was ruled by a governor, or satrap. Hmm. Those in Asia Minor, now threatened by Alexander's invasion, met to discuss strategy. Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, urged them to avoid battle with Alexander. Instead, he advised them to use a scorched earth strategy, to burn villages and crops, and withdraw to the interior. Alexander's army, he promised, would quickly starve. It was good advice, but the satraps were unwilling to lay waste to their own provinces without a fight. So they decided to face Alexander's army at the river Granicus. Uh, well, I think we all know what happens here. A glorious victory. The Persian <laughs> army formed up behind the river, which was shallow, but 60 feet wide with steep banks. Oh, wow. Their front line was a wall of cavalry, about 10,000 horsemen from across the empire. Medes and Hyrcanians from modern Iran, Bactrians from Afghanistan, and Paphlagonians from Turkey's Black Sea coast. Behind, in reserve, were the infantry, several thousand Greek mercenaries, oh, wow. a common sight in Persian armies at this time. These men fought for Persian gold, and were armed with the round shield and short spear of hoplites. The Persians may have been unsure if they could trust these men in combat against fellow Greeks, and so placed them at the rear. Alexander, determined to attack and destroy this Persian force before it could retreat, raced to the Granicus with his best troops. On his left wing, he posted Thessalian, Greek and Thracian cavalry, under Parmenian's command. In the centre were the massed spears of the phalanx, its six divisions commanded by Perdiccas, Koinos, Amintas, Philip, Meliager and Crateros. On the right, Alexander himself, with the companion cavalry under Philotas, as well as the elite hypaspists, the Agrianes javelin throwers, and the archers. Alexander, with 13,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry in all, was probably slightly outnumbered. outnumbered. But ignoring advice to wait word. until dawn to cross the river, he ordered an immediate assault. He sent a squadron of companion cavalry to ford the river, followed by a regiment of hypaspists and the Paeonian Light Cavalry. Alexander, calling on his men to show their courage, then led his right wing across the river. Interesting. He led it himself. Imagine that. As they reached the middle battles. of the river, the Greeks came under a hail of javelins, darts and arrows from the Persian line. I mean, when you're outnumbered, you gotta give them something. Those that made it to the far bank were immediately charged by the Persian cavalry. Alexander was in the thick of the fighting. He attacked where the whole mass of their cavalry and leaders were stationed. Around him, a desperate conflict raged. Horses were jammed against horses, and men against men. The Macedonians striving to drive the Persians away from the riverbank. The Persians determined to prevent them crossing, and to push them back into the river. Alexander's attack seemed reckless, but he was buying time for the rest of his army to cross the river, including the irresistible Macedonian phalanx. Shout out to Rogaldorn. <laughs> so here's our, these are his then, heavies suddenly, organized guys. Alexander yeah. was so he goes in spry to create chaos, yep. two draw nobles. most of the attention. Roissasis rode up to Alexander and struck him on the head with Helps his sword, breaking flank. off a piece of his helmet. 
but the helmet broke the force of the blow, and Alexander struck him down with his lance. Damn. Then, from behind, Spithridates raised his sword against the king, but Black Clytus, son of Dropidus, anticipated his blow, struck his arm, and cut it off, sword and all. Well, Alexander lives to fight another day. Now the Greek army was across the river, and the Persian cavalry faced a wall of Macedonian spears. Most turned and fled. The speed and shock of Alexander's attack meant Persia's Greek mercenaries hadn't even had time to join the battle. Alexander in a blood rage, or possibly regarding these Greeks as traitors, ignored their appeals for mercy. The mercenaries were surrounded on all sides and massacred. Damn. That's a message. Tolerate no traitors. <laughs> Alexander had won a great victory. Asia Minor now lay at his mercy. But the Persian Empire was still a land of immense wealth and power. Already, it was mobilizing its vast resources to face him. If Alexander was to conquer this empire and take his place in history, he'd next have to face Darius, King of Kings himself. Research and artwork for this video comes from Osprey Publishing's extensive range of books on ancient history. An absolutely beautiful Every Osprey book, book examines right a particular battle, campaign, or combat unit in authoritative, meticulous detail. And with more than 3,000 titles, they cover everything from ancient warfare to modern conflict. Visit their website to see their online catalogue. Well, uh, Jose, uh, right off the bat, we learned something very important. Uh, Alexander the Great, the peacemaker that he is, <laughs> through uh, peaceful means, tried to bring peace <laughs> to Persia. But of course, the Persian Empire was <laughs> on the pathway for total war. And despite numerous attempts, Alexander was forced, forced uh, into conflict. And now we're going to see the beginning of a new empire that will mm -hmm. bring peace and prosperity to the world. Um, I'm hoping all for the best for Alexander. It seems like he's on a fun journey with I, all his friends. Can I, and and more to, importantly, and more importantly, the fa the phalanx again. Sh shout out to you, to you, Rogaldorn. You yeah. are you, your namesake is definitely getting a a lot of praise. Yeah. So just remember this, Jose. Yeah. We are learning about what it takes to be a nonviolent fighter. Okay. Um. Hilarious. Uh. Let me just say this. Okay. So kids, dude's 20 years old, right? Like, and right here, like yeah. when he's like kicking ass right here at this moment. Yeah. He's like 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 yeah, I would say 20, 25 or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So like. And, 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 hold on. and if you know Alexander the Great's correct age, yeah. type in the comment section below. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I'm not here to just like dunk on people just to be a, a pointless <laughs> contrarian and I kind of class guy for no reason. Um, Alexander the Great is in history for a reason, you know, and we're, and I'm, I'm, uh, this is really cool to learn about. Uh, but it seems like his dad was rallying the Macedonia and an army, mm -hmm. mostly the because of the conflicts in Greece mm -hmm. and because Macedonia had its its stuff together, mm -hmm. he was able to become a, a prominent leader to get everyone organized. Yes. Um, it seems like traitor Greek generals, like military minds that went over to Persia. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and this is, I mean, I'm sorry, but like I, I have a, a, a modicum of respect for like what the Persian Empire also was. It was, mm -hmm. it was natural oasis of resources and wealth that got themselves organized. So it, it's more of a, uh, of an empire of, um, of convenience than what Greece and, and Alexander the Great is trying to cobble together, right? And, and, you know, and I think that's an important distinction. Now, it seems like those Greek generals and Persia had the wherewithal to be like, hey, if these guys are the smart military minds of, those, of that mm -hmm. side mm -hmm. and they're here with us, it's, it's smart for us to like, get to know them and understand them and give them, mm -hmm. and give them leeway. It seems like they were really cautioning from stop this madness war. Stop this, you know, like even when Alexander was coming, like come back this way. Mm -hmm. On the other side, people killed Alexander's dad because they didn't want to go to war. 
You know, it seemed like if Alexander wasn't pushed into this, everyone could have just been really chill and peaceful during that time. Well, see, that's why I have to Maybe. say, I, again, Maybe. again, thank you for making you my know. point. Alexander the Great is a peacemaker and he was forced, <laughs> forced into this. His father, his father wouldn't listen to him when Alexander was going to pass him the blunt. And you know what? I mean, at this point, sometimes like, you know, when he was forced into it, you know, Alexander the Great is quoted. Well, it looks like I got to start throwing down some MFers. OK. Man. And so Alexander the Great was forced into this. And you know what? He's still on his pathway for peace. And we're going to find out what happens on Alexander's fantastic, crazy, bizarre journey. Uh, <laughs> but the only way you're going to find out is if you uh, like, comment, share, and subscribe to uh, Chicago Reacts. And if there is a video you want us to react to, type in the comment section below. We push the phalanx forward.